Prescribed fire, a carefully planned and controlled fire, has been used for centuries to manage landscapes and promote healthy ecosystems. Nowhere is this more evident than in the Flint Hills of Kansas, where the tall grass prairie covers over four million acres. For decades, ranchers have used prescribed fire as a tool to manage their land and maintain the health of the prairie. A location with widespread acceptance and use of prescribed fire has been called a fire culture, but a clear definition of this term has remained elusive. By studying the history and traditions of the ranching community in the Flint Hills, we hope to better understand the relationship between ranching culture and fire culture. We hear from 50 Kansas ranchers, some of which have spent their entire lives on the land and have seen firsthand the benefits of prescribed fire. They share their experiences and explain how important it is to continue burning for the sake of the ecosystem and the local and state economy. Join us as we explore the rich history of prescribed fire in the Flint Hills and hear from the people who have helped shape this unique landscape. The tall grass prairie sways in the wind. But what many people don't realize is that this iconic landscape owes its very existence to the use of prescribed fire. I believe that the grasslands evolved with four major events. One of them is rainfall, one of them is sunshine, one of them is grazers, and one of them is fire. The prairie originated and developed with fire as an essential component of its evolution. If we don't continue to burn the prairie, we won't have any prairie. For generations, ranchers in the Flint Hills have recognized the importance of fire as a tool for managing their land. The main reason, being a cow-calf operation like we are, is for control of, of woody species. There's some economic reasons as far as cattle gains that uh, prescribed fire helps. We use prescribed fire because we want to keep our grasslands grasslands. The productivity of the grass, of the cattle on the grass is uh, significantly better on burned grass than it is on unburned. More important is that we are able to maintain a grassland as opposed to a forest. We have more trees here than ever at any time in history. And when these fires get started in the grass and we have wild winds that we sometimes have, they blow into the trees and spread from there. That's how they get into housing developments and so forth, like the big fires that we see in California on the West Coast. I think people don't think that could happen here, but the reality is it very much could happen here. So by prescribed burning, we're cleaning up large areas in a very safe manner. By burning their pastures, they not only reduce the risk of wildfires and promote the growth of new vegetation, but they also help maintain the health of the prairie ecosystem. Without fire, this landscape becomes uh, encroached in trees and shrubs and, and grassland species eventually fall out. So it's really, really important to maintain that, that fire. But the benefits of prescribed fire extend far beyond the boundaries of individual ranches. Tallgrass Prairie has been uh, affected by fire for as long as our records show. What we do find out is when fire is absent, it's very negative onto that environment. The use of prescribed burning has, has a, a, an extreme impact on our ecosystem in this area. The Flint Hills are home to a diverse array of native rangeland plants and animals that need both fire and grazing and the absence of woody plant species to thrive. Trees and brush really absorb a lot of water or use a lot of moisture and in places where we can eliminate those trees and, and shrubs you know, we can get water running where it hasn't been running in, in quite some time. In Chase County, we have seen the quail come back, a lot of wild turkey, of course deer. And prairie chickens, of course, uh, they, they like, they're a prairie bird. They're one of the more uh, 
problem birds, you might say. Well, I do think our, our prairie chicken numbers have, have come up the last couple of years. Our hope and the ideal impact is that we return it or, or maintain it as a native tall grass prairie. We've seen some areas that haven't been burned or we haven't been able to get fire into. We've seen neighbors that, that haven't burned for decades. Um, and we've seen the results, uh, the negative results of, of the encroachment of those woody species. Fire is, is unique in that it uh, it uh, takes the grass off and lets the new grass start and uh, there's just nothing that replaces fire. The biggest constraints that I have as far as getting everything done is the weather. From unexpected weather patterns to dry conditions, the forces of nature can be one of the biggest constraints on prescribed burning. You know, wind speeds and things like that. It's um, largely Mother Nature that determines whether we will or won't burn. Despite these challenges, ranchers in the Flint Hills continue to adapt and evolve their burning practices to best manage their land. I'll make a little chart actually and um, have a column for what the ideal wind will be for that particular piece of ground. As we get closer to the time of burning, I'll start looking at the, the wind, you know, at least three days ahead of time and monitor that constantly. And even when conditions don't cooperate, they never give up on the importance of prescribed fire to the health of the prairie ecosystem. The earliest known inhabitants of the region, Native Americans, used fire to manage the prairie ecosystem and promote the growth of new vegetation. We know, we know for a fact the Native Americans understood that burning brought the bison back and they were using it as a tool to facilitate the hunting of the bison. This has a really deep history. We're originally from Kansas. Ka is short for Kanza or Kanza. That is our traditional name and Kansas gets its name from our tribe. We would use fire on different occasions to help cleanse the prairie and attract game to the new succulents that were growing out of the prairie for our sustenance for our food sources. After a pasture is burned, we see the, the, the beauty that, that comes after that, the growth of the plant and how it eliminates the bad grasses out of there with, and the good grasses come back up. It's like a fertilizing method, you know, you might say, and that's what we recognize today, you know. Over time, this tradition was passed down to the ranchers who settled in the Flint Hills. My granddad used to burn pastures by dropping matches off the back of a horse. My great-great-grandfather settled about five miles east of where we are in the, the mid-1880s, and he started using prescribed fire then and it's just come down one generation to the other. They too recognized the value of fire as a tool for managing their land. And for generations, they have continued to use prescribed fire to promote the health of the prairie ecosystem. Not just the preferred method for managing the prairie in the Flint Hills, it's also the most effective. 65 years ago, it was considered uncouth to be burning the pastures, and there's a period of time when most recommendations from the universities and the specialists was don't burn, it's wasteful. Clint Owens be up at K-State. She was involved with some research to try to help prove to ranchers why they should not burn. When I came here in 1964, the university uh, did not recommend that you burn rangeland. In fact, they recommended that you not burn rangeland and they very quickly discovered that, yes, we, we definitely need to burn. The research turned out the exact opposite of what they were trying to prove. While alternative options theoretically exist, such as mechanical mowing or chemical herbicides, these methods are often impractical or too expensive and can have unintended consequences for the prairie ecosystem. I don't believe there are substitutes for prescribed fire, and I actually proved it to myself one year in trying to mow one area because I didn't get the kind of fire I wanted and I wanted to see if it would be the same. In a certain area, part of it was burned and part of it was mowed, and they don't graze it the same. The vegetative response isn't the same, and therefore your ability to control woody species isn't the same. Where we are in the Flint Hills, you know, we, we have the option of we can spray, um, but that's very expensive, only a temporary fix. 
and it's also not a very environmentally friendly fix because it not only destroys the woody species, it takes um, all the uh, forbs and what have you with, with it and makes it kind of a monoculture so that wildlife suffers from that. If you go through a pasture that's been sprayed aerially, you'll, you'll have really nice grass, but you'll kill all those forbs out and you've really taken a lot of your prairie out. Mechanically, it's terribly expensive to, and to even get where we want to go with uh, a mechanical means, whether it's mowing, it's very time consuming. It's dangerous in places where we need to get this done. Virtually all scientists that I know that have looked at this will tell you that you must have burning, uh, you must have some grazing uh, to continue to sustain those. By not having that burning as a tool will slowly, in some cases quickly, degrade the quality of our, our native grasslands economic impacts to, to the ranching community. It has negative wildlife impacts. By not doing prescribed burning on a frequent basis, we will have larger fuel loads that will develop. The whole state of Kansas and all of its residents will be at risk if we don't control and manage that fuel load. And prescribed fire is one of the most important and most economical ways to do so. Prescribed fire may seem like a risky and dangerous undertaking, but in reality, it's a highly thought out and carefully managed process. Well, the way we have it set up, anybody that's going to do a control burn, they have to call. If it's a day that there's a burn ban, we tell them they can't burn or if we're under like an extreme fire danger, they can't burn. And if the winds are above it, I think it's like 15 to 18 miles an hour, we tell them that we recommend they don't burn. The ones that decide to go ahead and burn, we send the fire department out there to put it out along with the deputy and they get a ticket. Ranchers who use prescribed fire work within state and county regulations. Our commissioners have set the burn regulations to follow the index and, and not allow burning when, the, when we have red flag days. Before any burning takes place, ranchers obtain the necessary permits and notify nearby residents of their plans. You call at daylight in the morning to the sheriff's department. They give you the wind and whether it's safe or not. Conduct your burn, do it as safely and as practical as you can, and then call the sheriff's office and say my fire is out. The other thing you always do is if you're in an area where you have neighbors that are, you try to check when they're burning and, and work together on it. Of course, we stand the liability of our fires, so we want to be very careful about them. We don't burn it for the fun of it. Got to have some training and know how to handle themselves and ha how to act around fire, so it isn't anything we take lightly. Safety when we're conducting the burn is the most important aspect of a successful burn. They also monitor weather conditions closely to ensure that burning is done safely and effectively. If we get into a drought situation, you know, it's really, really dry and, and the fire danger is really high. Sometimes the, the county commission will uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a burn ban that prevents any burning from occurring. There are a huge number of environmental constraints on when you can burn. And so what happens that causes problems is if you have a period of time like two to three weeks that you can't burn and then you get a good day to burn, you will burn because that may be the only short period that you can burn. We don't want to over-regulate the uh, the burning of the grasslands because it isn't something that we can just, it's just cut and dried and said we do it this way, this way, this way. Every year is different, every burn situation is different. Of course, with that said, some regulation is necessary and I think that's what we've got in the Flint Hills right now is moderate regulation and that's probably where it ought to be. We overall have a pretty good self-regulation with our ranchers. However, I, I think it's like anything else in life. You're always going to have the, the one or two outliers that, that don't really pay attention to what the, the neighbors say or, or what anybody else says, and, and they push the, the envelope. The ranching is, is um, something that people are very proud of when they do it. We just don't want total government interference. I think we're probably pretty fortunate that most of our our land managers are following that smoke management plan and and the data shows we haven't had near as many of those uh, of those exceedance days in in Kansas City and Wichita and, 
um, other areas, at least in Kansas, as what we used to have before we were participating in the smoke management plan. So I think it's a pretty good success story that farmers and ranchers care about the environment and the, and the air quality, whether it's at our ranch or in Lawrence, Kansas. By following these regulations and guidelines, ranchers are able to safely and effectively manage the prairie ecosystem through the use of prescribed fire. Do most residents of the Flint Hills accept prescribed fire as a normal practice? Although the environmental benefits of prescribed burning are widely acknowledged, there remains a lack of understanding among people both outside and sometimes even inside the Flint Hills region about the necessity of this practice. I think the complaint I hear the most is from an air quality standpoint. Folks who are dealing with, with asthma or any kind of, of breathing difficulties, when you end up in the hospital or emergency room because you're having an asthma attack, you start wanting to know why, and, and I get that. Most residents, I would say most native residents, accept prescribed burning uh, readily and understand it. According to these ranchers, as society becomes increasingly disconnected from agriculture and fails to grasp the cultural and ecological benefits of fire, there are some individuals who hold the belief that the Flint Hills can be effectively managed without the use of fire. Uh, yeah, I think for the reason that some people are opposed to fire is they don't uh, they don't really understand why we use it. I tell people when, when they when they talk to me about fire or any kind of prairie management, I tell them that there's you know the, the land manager has four tools at his disposal: grazing, rest, fire, and technology. People think that we can eliminate the burning and just use either mechanical means or chemical means to maintain what we're doing is just. That's, that's beyond me to think that we can go out here and, and mow the area that we burn. If they want this prairie to stay a prairie, we have to burn it regularly or it's going to be the national jungle. The use of prescribed fire in the Flint Hills not only benefits ranchers and landowners, but it also has a significant impact on the wider economy. I'll tell you, as far as the impact, that fire has on our economy at a very minimum, a very minimum, it's about $15 to $30 an acre difference in income between not burning and burning. The prairie ecosystem supports a variety of industries, including agriculture, tourism, and energy. Our wildlife, our pollinators, those, those different things, specific plants that, that do need fire, you know, to be in that ecosystem. And that's the one that would be really tough to put an economic value on. And of course, stepping back and realizing that we've had a couple years of, of wildfires in Kansas. Prairie will burn, whether that's under prescription or not. And so realizing that without that, fuel loads could get pretty intense. And then if we look at the, the damages and or the labor that it would take to try to control a wildfire, that could be very substantial. Prescribed fire helps to maintain the health of the prairie ecosystem which in turn supports grazing lands for cattle and other livestock. This supports the ranching industry and provides economic opportunities for rural communities throughout the region. As far as economic impact, I think it would be substantial. Um, you know, you see the research about, you know, that burned grass is gonna hopefully add another quarter of a pound a day on, on some of these yearling operations. Uh, and you take that times the 90 day grazing season, I mean that's another 30 plus pounds that you've uh, foregone if, if you couldn't uh, do that prescribed burn. These guys are trying to find everything they can do to, to provide as much economic benefit to their operations as they can and yeah you take 30 or 40 dollars away per head times 500 head that's you know over $15,000 that, that's not either coming back into your community or putting back into the producer's operation. In the past, we have estimated that uh, uh, impact of fire on productivity of uh, just livestock, and uh, that runs uh, close to 180 to $100 million per year if you include the Flint Hills region and uh, uh, the Osage Hills of Oklahoma. 
Prescribed burning is not a task that is taken lightly by ranchers in the Flint Hills. It is a highly specialized skill that requires extensive training and experience in order to carry out safely and effectively, and an understanding of prairie ecology that underpins the use of fire. How well informed do I feel on making decisions about using prescribed fire? I, f I feel very comfortable in that position on you know what we're going to burn and when we're going to burn it and, and how we're going to burn it for several reasons, because of education from other, other sources and, um, and experience and just knowing what, what can happen or uh, you know, what are the pot potential results of what we want to accomplish. When today I can pull out my smartphone and look at climatic conditions that are going to be hitting here in a half hour, boy, I think that's quite a tool to use. Ranchers who use prescribed fire improve their skills with training and certification programs, which cover topics such as fire behavior, fuel load management, weather patterns, and safety protocols. We learn about new methods or pr techniques through educational programs such as ranch field days, seminars at K-State, or through the Extension Service, and by word of mouth from your friends and your neighbors. How do I share information about fire? If anyone asks, I'll be glad to share with them. So you, you learn by from others and, and then making some mistakes as well. What is my personal step-by-step -step process when planning a burn? At some point in the fall, we uh, assess the grass. Uh, this is after a freeze, or right before a freeze, and determine whether or not uh, that particular piece of grass really needs to be burned the next year. Uh, my personal process for conducting a, a planned burn um, begins well in advance. You know, we'll have a list of what we want to burn for the year, um, when we want to burn it, whether it, can, whether it depends on what species we're trying to control. If there's a drought, we do not burn much at all. There's a lot of people say you should only burn, you know, two or three times in five years. I don't follow those rules at all. If I have a, a invasive problem, I'm not afraid to burn two or three years in a row. And then as the winter progresses, we monitor moisture content. That's all in preparation to burn. The main trend for the spring may be dry or something, so we may not burn everything that we want to, uh, but there's also places that, um, that maybe we've taken on that hadn't been burned for a number of years and really need to, or have some catching up to do so that we really need to get those things burned when we can or as often as we can for a little while. Uh, we never tr try to burn the same spot the next year, so we rotate through. If we hay a place, we'll probably burn it ahead of time so that it is clean. We know when we want to burn, but we don't know when the neighbors are, and so we need to be ready and have our sprayer working so that they're ready to go if we need them. I'm sure our lighting equipment, our drip torches and, and rakes are ready to go. And then on the day of the burn, you know, before we even start anything, we'll triple check the weather, check the smoke model one more time and uh, visit with the neighbors. We'll generally have a, a community meeting ahead of lighting anything. Um, and then if everybody's on the same page and in agreement, we will go light that fire. Having a plan, having a burn plan, uh, watching the weather, picking the right day to burn, having your neighbors notified, having a crew so that you're not out here by yourself, having plenty of water, uh, having, having equipment that works, having the water. And just be sure that the perimeter is, is contained and, and out. Um, you know, there may be burning stuff inside of that and there probably will be for, you know, one or two or three or four days depending on what we're doing. And, uh, but once we want to be sure that we have a safe perimeter around that fire. These ranchers of the Flint Hills see themselves as part of a fire culture that extends far beyond their own community. Through their use of prescribed fire, they are carrying on a tradition that dates back thousands of years, and they are helping to preserve and protect the prairie ecosystem for future generations. I do see myself or hope that I'm a part of the tradition that has brought fires management 
in use in the Flint Hills because I think it really leads not to just fire, but better management of our asset that we have that we're fortunate enough to work with every day in these beautiful hills that are called the Flint Hills and the tall grass prairie. But the use of prescribed fire is not unique to the Flint Hills. Fire culture exists in other rangelands around the world, where ranchers and land managers have long recognized the benefits of using fire as a tool for managing the land. Whether it's the savannas of Africa or the grasslands of Australia, prescribed fire has been used for centuries to maintain healthy ecosystems and support vibrant communities. It's just critical, as far as I'm concerned, that we address the problems in a way that will sustain the use of fire in the Flint Hills region. Because without it, the Flint Hills as we know them will essentially disappear as a grazing resource. To learn more about Flint Hills fire culture, please visit gpfirescience.org.